All right, today I have for you a video called The Franco-Prussian War and Animated History by the Amateur Historian. The reason why I want to do a video on the Franco-Prussian War is because I've noticed I bring it up a lot. Um, it was a very important uh, part of my undergraduate thesis paper, and for my master's thesis, it comes up again. Um, so. I think it's sort of one of my go-tos, and which is probably why I bring it up so often, because it's something I'm very, very familiar with and that I have studied in great detail um, for my undergraduate and for my graduate programs. But um, so I feel like I keep bringing it up, and people are probably like, "What the hell's a Franco-Prussian War? Why does this guy keep talking about it?" So I figured I'd do a video on it. Um, this is a really quick video. But his videos are usually very quick but informative, so we'll dive right in. I'm sure I might have something else to say about it afterwards, but let's just dive right in and see what he's got. When I want to understand the cause or the impact of a war in history, it can be very tempting for me to read a basic synopsis of the conflict and believe that I understand the general idea. But oftentimes these summaries are limited, or at worst, misleading. This is especially true of the Franco-Prussian War, which was produced by years of contention and complex diplomatic intrigue. So to understand it, we first need to illustrate the geopolitical situation in Europe at the time. It's 1852 in France, and in an attempt to reanimate the French Empire, President Napoleon III names himself the new Emperor of France. This act blatantly signals the French re-entry into active power projection. Fast forward a year later in 1853, and France's new Emperor is already provoking Russia in the Crimean War. And even though France would claim victory, the war still proved rather inconclusive, but it did help bring France back onto the international stage. Regardless of this, Napoleon III was still eager for a more prestigious and powerful France. Switch over to Prussia in 1866 under King Wilhelm I as he finishes the Seven Weeks War against Austria. This war concluded with the formation of the North German Confederation and the end of Austria's influence in the German region, with half of Germany now unified. Yeah, so very quickly, this war, I mean, it's a very short war, but it was not ended over like an occupation or a massive invasion or anything like that. It was basically ended because Austria realized that the Prussians were that much better than they were. Um, the real competition between the two was both of them wanted to unite the Germanic states. Uh, Prussia really had northern states already within its sphere of influence, and Austria had all the southern states within its sphere of influence. So both of them wanted to, to unite Germany. Uh, but it was really a question of who was going to do that. Was it going to be Austria or was it going to be Prussia? This war settled it. It was going to be Prussia. Um, the war was so quick and devastating to the Austrians that they just sort of backed off the end of the war very soon after it started because they just felt like there was no way they were going to compete with the Prussians. And the Prussians winning as fast as they did and as effectively as it did sort of helped to win over those southern states because they felt one of two things. That one didn't want to piss off Russia because look what they just did to the Austrians, and the Austrians were no pushovers. Um, and two, they can protect us. Uh, the, the Prussians can protect us. If there's an outside enemy, we and we are allied with Prussia, that's very good for us. So one, we don't want to upset them and have them come after us, and two, it's more beneficial to be on their side because if someone does come after us, we will have this very powerful country as our ally. Um, but yeah, it was a very, very quick war, and it was basically only a handful of battles, I think it was, in which the Prussians just absolutely overwhelmed and beat the Austrians uh, very clearly and very significantly. ...under Prussia's banner, and southern Germany without Austria's protection, Prussia sees a clear opportunity to expand her borders south. But there's one looming threat standing in her way. As can be inferred, the prospect of a unified German state to oppose France was not taken well by the French people and government. We can see the growing tension by the late 1860s between the two competitors. Both sides knew that war was inevitable. 
France needed to stop Prussia from expanding, and Prussia sought to unite Germany. But neither side wanted to start the war against each other out of fear of intervention by powers such as Britain and Russia. So for now, both sides would remain quiet. As tensions did increase, one event would prompt the two nations to take action against one another. In June of 1870, revolutionaries in Spain ousted their queen, Isabella II. The country was then without a legitimate ruler, and a letter was sent by the Spanish military junta to the Prussian prince Leopold, offering him the crown. King Wilhelm was hesitant to endorse Leopold, but Otto von Bismarck recognized the potential to gain an ally on the Iberian Peninsula. Bismarck eventually convinced Leopold in secret to accept the invitation onto the Spanish throne, but Napoleon learned of it soon enough. He was in full protest, and demanded that Wilhelm object to Leopold's coronation. Wilhelm did so in order to prevent a premature war, but Napoleon III pushed it further. He sent a diplomat, Count Vincent Benedetti, to speak with Wilhelm I. The French diplomat demanded that the Spanish throne should not be meddled with by the Germans in complete perpetuity, but Wilhelm refused. What would then be dubbed the Ems Dispatch was sent to Bismarck from Wilhelm, outlining the meeting between the French diplomat and himself. Otto von Bismarck found himself in the perfect position to justify a war with France without the possibility of international repercussions. Bismarck published the Ems Dispatch in the press, but manipulated it to make both the diplomat and the king come off as insulting towards one another this inflamed public opinion yeah so um uh Otto von Bismarck was brilliant devious but brilliant he knew how to push Napoleon's buttons he really knew how to manipulate people and this is not the first time he does something like this um this what this letter is really what does spark the war but it's not the only one. Uh, there were many communications that were sent between the diplomats in which Bismarck would uh, change them, or he would write them in a way that when they were translated to French, they came across as very insulting. Um, and in some instances, some of these things were written in a way that seemed fairly innocent when they're write, written in German, but then when read in French, they were like, Hey, wait a minute. Is this kind of a backhanded comment? Is what is this? You know, so he had this sort of plausible deniability of just like, well, I don't speak French. How is I supposed to know it's going to come off that way? Um, he did a lot of this, and this was a big one. This one, he really did go and actually manipulate the letter to make it sound very insulting and it wasn't even like a censorship or blacking things out like he showed in the picture it was just changing certain words he just changed words and phrases and by doing that it came across as very insulting to france and to napoleon and it was very inflammatory but that's all it took that's all it really took and it was one of many many provocations um Bismarck had Napoleon's number. He knew how to make him mad. And Napoleon wasn't the brightest anyways. He was kind of impulsive and he was kind of an idiot. And so he uh, easily fell for a lot of Bismarck's uh, little traps that they like to set for him. In France, so much so that on the 15th of July, the French parliament approved of mobilization in preparation for war against Prussia. In reaction, the Prussian and Bavarian armies mobilized a day later. By the 19th of July, France officially declared war and hostilities commenced. As Bismarck foresaw, no other nations decided to intervene in the war. General mobilization in France would end at around 900,000 men as the war progressed, and the Germans would mobilize 900,000 on top of their already 500,000 strong army. By late July, Napoleon III officially assumed command of the French forces at Metz, numbering around 200,000 men. In early August, Napoleon III took the offensive, but would soon withdraw before the Germans could arrive after realizing the scale of their mobilization, which was faster and more efficient than that of the French. Furthermore, the German army was logistically superior to the French army, mainly through Prussia's more competent usage of railroads. This allowed the Germans to deploy far quicker. By mid-August, a series of battles would take place all over France, and the Germans would be constantly on the offensive. 
The most pivotal battle took place a month later at Sedan on the 1st of September, where 200,000 soldiers confronted 130,000 French soldiers who were attempting to relieve the siege of Metz. With the adept leadership of Field Marshal Helmut von Moltke, the Prussians encircled the French and quickly broke their lines, ultimately resulting in the surrender of Napoleon III and his entire army, marking the end of the Second French Empire and the beginning of the Third French Republic. With the capture of the main French army, the Germans proceeded to Paris just a day later, subjecting it to a nightmarish 130 30-day siege, which the new Republican government tried to break several times without any success. With Paris starving, the French government... Yeah, so at this point, um, Napoleon and his army had been captured, but Napoleon was allowed to leave. And he ended up fleeing to um, Britain, into England, and where he was staying at a... Um, like a, an estate. Meanwhile, as we see here, the Germans are sieging Paris, and this goes on for quite a while, um, for many months, and the people are starving and desperate while Napoleon is living a life of luxury, even in exile, he's living a life of luxury while his people are starving and dying, and he's refusing to come back and sign a, a peace treaty. Um, so the, the French basically say, well, forget him, we'll make our own government, and they do, and they try to negotiate with the, with the Germans, but the Germans say, no, we want Napoleon to sign this. Bismarck was adamant that Napoleon signed it, not some other French government. So uh, after many months, they basically bring him back, kicking and screaming, he does sign the treaty, but, and then he's kicked out of the country again, because part of the treaty was he had to abdicate and be exiled, but... <laughs> He's, he's kicked, brought up the country to sign a treaty, then kicked out again. Uh, Germany just, well, Bismarck just loved messing with this guy. But yeah, so he, this is how disconnected he was as a leader, that he was, um, he was living life of luxury while his people were literally starving to death. Um, and, and not just people out in, in remote areas, people in the capital, people in Paris were starving to death. Initiated peace talks on the 24th of January, five days after King Wilhelm was proclaimed Emperor of Germany, out of which they obtained a ceasefire agreement. After intense negotiations in the Treaty of Frankfurt, the Germans successfully proposed a treaty in which they were given the German-speaking region of Alsace-Lorraine and made France recognize the German Empire. On top of this, France was obliged to pay 5 billion francs to cover the costs of German occupation. As Napoleon III had abdicated, the Papal States were absorbed into the Kingdom of Italy, meaning both Germany and Italy were officially unified. The integration of Alsace Lorraine by the Germans from the French would lead to even more friction between the two powers, which contributed to the causes of World War I, in which the French would reacquire the region. In this war, the Germans suffered approximately 45,000 dead and 90,000 wounded. The French suffered around 140,000 dead and 140,000 wounded, and almost 500,000 captured. At a glance, the Franco-Prussian War was started by France over a letter. This is the most apparent reason for the conflict, however, it is just as important to look at everything behind the scenes from multiple perspectives. By understanding all of the background information, one could make the case that Prussia was the true aggressor. This is a clear example in history of fabrication and public manipulation to justify an entire war. To that point, it's fairly obvious that the war wasn't just about insults and national pride, but rather about the long-term geopolitical entanglements of the German and French interests. For this reason, a thorough study of any historical event is imperative to to see past the ostensible. If you want to know how the North German Confederation and their allies won the war so quickly, be sure to check out our follow-up video on the... Yeah, so as I said before, this was a video, I wanted to do a video on the Franco-Prussian War. His videos were nice and short, sweet, and to the point. So I figured I'd do one of them. Um, because this war, I do bring up a lot. I My capstone for my undergraduate was the... Um, unification and rise of the German Empire. Um, so obviously this was the culmination of all of that. This was the final major event in which leads to the unification of Germany. And I do bring it up again in my master's thesis. So it, it's something that I've studied a lot. And it was something that I sort of keep bringing up. And so I figured I'd do a video on it, uh, a nice short one, to highlight what it is because otherwise people are like, you know, why keep talking about this war? But um, one of the reasons why I do bring it up a lot is because it does have a lot of mirrors of 
World War One. Not so much mirrors, but a lot of aspects that we've seen in World War One. World War One, the French want to take back Alsace Lorraine. They also want revenge for such a humiliating defeat. At the same time, the Germans also want to project more power continentally in World War One. So they are ready to crush the French again uh, and sort of influence Europe and become uh, the major influencer in Europe. Um, they want a, a German Europe. Um, so they're pretty ready to slug it out when World War I comes around. It, now, no way am I saying that World War I is caused by the Franco-Prussian War, but World War I would have been very different without the Franco-Prussian War. Um, it really just set the stage for those Franco-German relations, um, which were not nice, but, um, yeah, he does a good job of, as he always does, of describing the war and it's very, very quickly. Now this isn't a war, this is a war that you can talk about pretty quickly. There's a lot that goes on in the war and a lot of stuff and Really, it's the build-up to the war that is more interesting and much more in-depth than the war itself. The war is so short. The combat only lasts an actual month, literally a month. Um, and the Siege of Paris goes on for the rest of uh, about four or five months. And so it, it's not a very big conflict, but its build-up is huge and its after-effects are huge. Uh, one of the things that we see is that the French are forced to recognize the formation of the German Empire. So under an international law, even back then and today, all it takes for a country to become a legal nation is the recognition of their sovereignty by another country. Um, so that's what they were looking for. And then they forced France to legally recognize their sovereignty in a treaty. Therefore, they were a country um, in every respect. They also imposed heavy reparations onto the French. They took Alsace Lorraine, and they did it all in the house of Versailles, the hall of Versailles. World War I ends. The treaty is signed in the Hall of Versailles. The Germans are forced to pay the French um, heavy reparations. And the French, uh, I mean, the other Entente members were on board with this too, but if really the French that pushed for it was the um, weakening of Germany, putting those restrictions on Germany in terms of military and everything like that, because everyone was afraid that Germany was going to try again, um, which they did, <laughs> which they do anyways, regardless of the treaty, actually probably because of the treaty, but let's be honest, but it, it's one of those things where you see it sort of back and forth, and it's between Alsace Lorraine, who owns it, we see a back and forth between who is forced to do what, we see a back and forth between who has to pay who, um, so there's a lot of that. Now, one thing he doesn't talk about in this video that I feel like is very important is the diplomatic isolation of France at the time. Now, my master's thesis was on the effects of the American Civil War on major European nations. And in it, I talk about the French invasion of Mexico. Um, I've already done a video on this topic, actually, on, so I will put the link somewhere in this video, and you can check that one out if you're interested, but very quickly, you know, the the French, the French, British, and Spanish invade to get money back that is owed to them by Mexico. The French end up just conquering the whole country. The Spanish and British realize what the French are up to. They leave in a huff. The Americans are too busy in the Civil War to intervene until once the Civil War is over, and then they do intervene on behalf of the the Mexicans, and they force the French to leave. The French abandon Maximilian, who is an Austrian, um, 
and he's the one that they put into power in Mexico. They sort of abandoned him. He's eventually captured about a year, year and a half later and executed, which really, really makes the, uh, the Austrians mad. So in a way, so now France, and this isn't the only thing they did, but this is probably one of the bigger things that they did. So France has absolutely no love from the United States at all. Um, being a monarchy alone was enough, but they were already not going to get any help from the United States. They probably wouldn't have anyways, to be honest, but the United States may have like sold the weapons or something, but you know, because they were, you know, the United States sold weapons and things to numerous small countries and even to Spain actually this time. Um, they had the war industry, so they used it. But they were going to get no help there. And it was unlikely anyways. But they were going to get no help there. They were going to get no help from the British. The British you know, were finally kind of getting along with the French after so long. And they felt sort of betrayed by this, that the French had let their ambitions get in the way of um, the mutual understanding that the British thought that they had with the French. And when I say the French, I'm mostly referring to Napoleon III and his regime, but mostly Napoleon. His ambitions, he, he had a lot of them. So he, he was the... Uh, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, um, and the the cousin of Napoleon's uh, son, Napoleon II, who died at like age twenty two or twenty three, early twenties. He died very young. But Napoleon III had a lot of ambitions with his uncle. That's why he sort of made himself emperor. He went on all sorts of campaigns to try to build up the French Empire. Um, but in doing so, he definitely alienated a lot of people. So the British didn't want to help him. Um, Spanish traditionally actually really liked France. Um, under Isabella, they really liked France because France was the largest and most powerful Catholic country in the world, um, never mind Europe. And they also controlled the Papal States. So they controlled, you know, where the Pope lives and where they all live. So that was a huge deal. Um, now, when they were sort of backstabbed by France, by the actions in the event of, of Mexico, the Spanish sort of turned their, a cold shoulder onto France. They no longer respected them in the same way. Now, Spain wasn't in the best position to help them anyways, regardless of someone being overthrown. So when Isabella was overthrown, the, uh, the Spanish were more than happy to have a German come in because now they're having sympathies towards the Prussians. They didn't really like the Austrians because the Austrians um, were close to the French. They were also, even though the Austrians were Catholic and the Prussians were Protestant, they still accepted, they still preferred it. Um, also, an Austrian had been put in power as a puppet in Mexico, and so they didn't want that same thing. They were trying not to become you know, a client state. Um, so you can see that they really didn't like Napoleon at all by the fact that they were trying to get somebody in power that was in league with France's biggest rival. And the French were trying to put someone in power too, and the Spanish didn't really want him. Um, they definitely wanted the Habsburg. But um, yeah, so France had alienated Spain pretty bad, and then with the overthrow of Isabella, those that took over really didn't want to help France. And then the biggest one is Austria. Austria and France had a treaty. It was a defensive treaty, and it said that if one of the countries were to be attacked by Prussia, then the other would intervene. However, France looked at war. And so now this defensive pact doesn't apply. Emperor Maximilian of Mexico 
was the younger brother of the Austrian emperor. So Austria wasn't very happy with France that they allowed a uh, member of the royal family. The emperor of Austria wasn't very happy with Napoleon that Napoleon abandoned his little brother and allowed him to be executed by the Mexicans. Yeah, so there's a little bit of tension there. They would have honored the treaty probably if it had been an aggressive move by the Prussians and Bismarck knew that because the Austrians did have something to gain by bringing, uh, by bringing Prussia down. I don't think it would have been enough to actually remove Prussia as being the dominant force, but it would have sort of made up for a lot of the losses that Austria faced at the hands of Prussia and may have allowed them to regain some of their influence over the southern um, Germanic states. But they were not going to come to help them. The fact that they didn't come to help them is a huge because if they just opened up uh, a front on the other side and made put Germany into a two-front war, well, we know what happens in Germany is a two-front war, nothing good. So if that had happened, then the French probably would have survived. But they didn't. They were they found themselves completely alone, and their overall strategy and doctrines did not allow for that, which is why the Germans overran them so badly. Also, there was a lot of, uh, during the American Civil War, most of these countries sent military observers to uh, America to watch the war, and Prussia and France were two of those countries. Uh, both were taking notes and were seeing how effective certain strategies were, how new weapons were, and coming home and applying those to their army. Now France is slower to apply it than the Prussians. The Prussians already had a pretty extensive uh, railway network, but when they saw how effectively the Union used it, they expanded on it. Helmut von Molt, the um, head of the German military, went to Bismarck and said, we need to expand these railroads, and Bismarck agreed. And so they, they did, and it was a, a huge factor in how quickly Germany was able to go after France. They were able to mobilize and get to the front lines um, the fastest that you possibly could for the time. It was incredible speed for the time. It was, you know, the equivalent of getting into hypersonic jets and flying across the world now. So, um, yeah, it was very, very effective. And then just some use of new weapons that Yes, we're using the Crimean War, but we're used more widespread in the American Civil War, like rifles, rifle artillery, explosive artillery shells, things of that nature that were used. And these countries are already adopting them, but now they're seeing how they were used. And because the Crimean War was a fairly limited war compared to the American Civil War, so they were able to see more how it was used without having to put themselves into a war. Um, and the Prussians were able to sort of test them out first because they fought in 1866, the year after the American Civil War ended, against the Austrians and they sort of, sort of test this stuff out more, whereas the French never had that opportunity and it really did help. Um, so like I said, it was, a, it was a very quick war. It was over, the combat was over in a month. Um, they never really stood a chance. But yeah, like I said before, I really wanted to do a video on the Franco-Prussian War because I do bring it up a lot. And I'm just thinking some people may not know what it is. It's not one of those wars you necessarily hear about or really know what it is. Or you, you have heard of it, but you're not really sure. Um, so I wanted to do a quick video on that. And um, just so that I can sort of refer to this when I, when I start talking about it again. And I'm sure that I will. So yeah, very quickly just want to do something on this war in particular because I do bring it up a lot and it is sort of a personal interest of my own being important in both my undergraduate and graduate uh, capstone projects. So anyway, I'm going to end the video there. Uh, if you liked the video, please like and subscribe. If you have any other videos you want me to do, whether history or alternative history, please put in the comment section. I'll be sure to check them out and I will see you next time.